Amen. Everybody said praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for being here. And thank you for being in the house of the Lord. I'm going to ask my wife to come at this time and join me on the keyboard. And I said it in the first service. It just sounds so weird to say my wife, but it sounds amazing to say my wife. Amen. And I'm so thankful that she's here today. And I'm so thankful that we get to start doing ministry together and, 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 and experience the blessings of the Lord. And she gets to meet all of you incredible folks. I, I told uh, the first service uh, we were here, I said the last time me and her were here together was back in September. And we didn't tell anybody uh, then, but uh, we just came to Sunday service that day. And, but we didn't tell anybody the night before we had gotten engaged. And Pastor and Sister Panero knew, but that was it. And so the last time we were here getting engaged, this time it's our first weekend out since we've been married. And it's good to be at Revival Tabernacle for our first weekend as a married couple in church. And I can't think of a better church and better people to be with than, than y'all. And you're amazing. As I always say every time, well, you're not recording this service, remember? And uh, of course, your weather is next to heaven. I'm sure you hear that all the time. You all know that. Whatever. I'm envious. The week of our wedding, it was breaking record temperatures in Texas for being cold. It's usually 70s. It was 19 degrees in Texas. And here in Santa Maria, everything was just perfect. And I was thinking, dear Lord, God, help us. But it's good to be here today. And I'll, I'll just briefly mention, as Pastor Panero uh, said just a moment ago, for the last few years, my heartbeat has been missions. I've been to around 25 or so countries and... Uh, for the last three, four years, my heartbeat has been missions. And in 2022, the Lord began to deal with me about the country of Australia and that whole region, not just the country, but the surrounding nations around Australia, Fiji, Vanuatu, New Zealand, Samoa, all of those around there. And I began to talk to the Lord and I called the superintendent of Australia, Pastor Stan Harvey, who's an amazing man, and I began to talk to him. I said, Pastor, what can we do to make an impact in this entire region? And he said, well, Tyler, this entire region needs training. And a lot of these people can't get out of their countries and come to the United States where training abounds. And people hear what we hear on an everyday, every weekend basis about apostolic authority and the fivefold ministry and church and ministry, all of that. And he said, what these churches and people and teams need over here is they need training. I said, so what can we do, Pastor? He said, well, if you brought a team over, he said, it would be the first of its kind in this area. And so we established a team and we're taking uh, a team of around 20 people over to that region that we are going to be training, we are going to be equipping, we are going to be engaging uh, the nations, and we're so excited about what the Lord is going to do, and what we take advantage of, and we think is normal on an everyday basis over here, is not normal to them over there. And as of this point, for the training portion of this whole mission, we have around five different nations coming right now to Sydney, Australia, to learn for two, three days and to be equipped and engaged with tools that will help them carry out the gospel in their own home churches. And so praise God for what he's doing. I want to say thank you to this church and to Pastor Panero for your vision for global revival. The Lord is doing a work worldwide, and we're excited about a church partnering with us that has a kingdom mentality. Amen. And this church has a kingdom mentality. I want to say thank you for that. And we'll keep you updated and we'll keep you appraised of everything going on. And we can't wait to see what the Lord 
is going to do. Somebody said amen. And me and uh, Nicole, my wife, were talking yesterday before we left Houston about what are we going to sing tomorrow. And uh, this old song, I just said, what if we did this in this key? And this old song popped into my mind. It just says, I've had some good days. I've had some hills to climb. I've had some weary days And I've had some sleepless nights But when I look around And I think things over Anybody ever had some of those days? All of my good days outweigh my bad days. I won't complain. Here's why I won't complain. Because God's been good to me. He's been so good to me. More than this world could be He's been so good to me He dried my tears away Turned my midnight into day So I'll say Thank you, Lord. I won't complain. Sometimes the clouds hang low. I can hardly see the road. And I ask the question. Why, why, why so much pain? But he knows what's best for me. Though my weary eyes, they can't see. So I'll say thank you, Lord. I Oh, God's been good to me. He's been so good to me. More than this world could be. He's been so good to me. So I'll say thank you, Lord. So I'll say thank you, Lord. I won't complain. If the Lord's been good to you, will you lift a hand towards heaven right now? Oh, Jesus, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. Hallelujah. Oh, I just feel like saying it again. Say, God's been good to me. He's been so good to me more than this world 
could be He's been so good to me He dried my tears away Turned my midnight into day so I'll say, thank you, Lord. Can you lift a hand right now and just tell him thank you? So I'll say, thank you, Lord. Something comes into my soul and says, thank you, Lord. I won't complain. Second yeah. Kings chapter two, verse number eighteen. Second Kings chapter two, verse number eighteen. Thank you for worshiping. I'm well aware what time it is today, and I also smell the tacos next door. I'm, every time I come, y'all cook. I don't know if that's an incentive for me to quit quicker. Or I, I don't know what it is, but it's working because my stomach is growling. Second Kings chapter 2, verse number 18. And when they came again to him, for he tarried at Jericho, he said unto them, Did I not say unto you, Go not? All the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant. As my Lord seeth, but the water is not, and the ground barren. And he said, Bring me a new cruise, and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters, and cast the salt in there, and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. And there shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed. Unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. I'll preach for a few moments today on the subject simply, it's a salt solution. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, no matter what it looks like, it's a salt solution. It's a salt solution. God bless you. Thank you for standing. Thank you for worshiping. You may be seated today. Once again, I give honor to my wife this morning, one of the most talented, the most beautiful, the most amazing people on the face of the earth. I love you. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to go on a trip to the great nation of Israel. And if you're ever able to go, anybody ever gone before? You know it's an amazing place. Um, and it'll change your life and everything about your perspective about the life of Jesus because you're walking where he walked. You see what he saw. And during one of the days of our trips, uh, we were able to go and wade into the waters of the Jordan River. And we were able to see where Jesus was baptized, where the Israelites crossed over, where Naaman dipped seven times. And all the miracles and things you read about in the Bible, we were able to see where it happened. And it's really quite life-changing. And on our way back to the hotel on one of those days, I glanced out the bus window and began seeing direction signs on the side of the road pointing to different cities. And on one of these signs, it articulated the distance to the city of Jericho. And not long after, our guide pointed out the window, and on the right-hand side, not far from the Jordan River, were the remains of this great place. And my mind began to wonder, Pastor, what would it have been like for Joshua to cross over the Jordan? And the first thing they see standing in their way on their conquest of Canaan is Jericho. What would it have been like to have been there the day that Jericho was brought down by a shout? What would it have been like to have been Rahab to see that everything else around you fell except for your house? What did it look like when he or the Bethelite rebuilt the city to its former glory? What did Jesus think when he passed through its gates? What sounds did Bartimaeus hear as he sat by the road begging outside its gates? And what went through the minds of the two blind men 
when they finally saw its walls after Jesus took pity on them and healed them. And in reality, what we mostly hear about and remember in regards to Jericho is the amazing story about how it felt when they marched around the city seven times and they let out a shout. Anybody remember that story? And today, even today, 18,000 people live in Jericho. And we really don't talk a lot about its cursed rebuilding when it was reconstructed. And when Joshua said, cursed before the Lord, be the man who rises up and rebuilds this city. He's going to, going to cost him his firstborn. And it's going to, the firstborns are going to die. They're going to lay in the foundation. And to this day, excavations are still finding skeletal remains inside the foundations of the second reconstruction. And it's rebuilt now in a shadow of its former glory. And we find it reappearing in 2 Kings. And the great city of Jericho now has a problem. The prophet Elisha has just seen his mentor taken up in a chariot of fire. He's caught the mantle from Elijah after watching it fall. And he takes that mantle and goes and stands on the banks of the Jordan River. And there he smites the water with the same mantle that Elijah had possessed. And he cries out, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And that day he found out that there are still miracles in the mantle. Because the waters part and Elisha walks across. And here comes Elisha to the great city of Jericho and he begins to dwell there just a few miles away from the Jordan. And while he's tarrying there, the men of the city and the sons of the prophets come to him and they begin to describe Jericho to Elisha. Elisha, you can see the situation of our city is pleasant. You see that Jericho is glorious. It's beautiful. It's prosperous. It's wealthy. It's pleasurable. It's right in the middle of everything. It's right in the geographical perfect location. It's got everything, and while our city in all of its glory is pleasant, Elisha, our city also has a problem. The water here is sick. Our water is not, and the ground is barren. And in the day in which they lived, and even in the present world today, we all know that water was and is the source of life for all humanity. 71% of the earth's surface is water. 89% of fruit is water. 60% of your human body is water. And while some can go for weeks without crumble cookie and In-N-Out burger and Taco Bell and all of your favorite things, and you can go for a long time without those, but the average human being can only go for three to four days without water. And you can live on the rock star, Red Bulls, and all the caffeine patches, and all of that. You can live on them for a while, but how many know there comes a certain point when your body just tells you, hey, you need to have some water. And where there's a lack of water, there's a lack of life, because water is life. That's why rain was such a precious commodity back in that day and in that area, because when it rained, it provided them with life. When there was no rain, there would be no crops. When there was no rain, there would be no herds of cattle. There would be no full reservoirs. There would no be no harvest. And so I know we quote that verse, it rains on the just and the unjust. But, Pastor, we often look at that from a wrong perspective because in that day, rain was a sign of blessing. Rain was a sign of God's favor. So the right way to look at that verse is not in a negative light. Oh, it rains on the just and the unjust. It's going to rain. No, no, no. It's not a bad thing. But the right way to look at it and to say it would be, it rains on the just and the unjust, but good and unexplainable things happen to the just and the unjust. And if you're going to be involved in kingdom work like your theme is, you're going to have to learn to be content when it rains. Because rain blesses everybody. Rain blesses somebody that's growing at a faster pace than you are. I've seen rain bless people with a bad attitude. I've seen rain bless people that are having more success than you are. Somebody that's not committed as you are. I've seen rain bless them. And it's going to rain. But what is, what's going to be your reaction when the rain blesses somebody else? 
And for some reason and somehow, here their water supply is not and the ground is barren and their life source is in jeopardy. And the words not and barren here mean caused to miscarry. The water source or their life source is so poisoned and it's so sick that the tree that receives its provenance from this water throws its fruit on the ground and it can't produce a harvest. If a heifer who was carrying a calf were to drink from this water, the water was so poisonous the calf would die. As a matter of fact, commentaries make note that if a woman who was pregnant with child wanted to abort her child, she would come here and drink from this water so she would purposely miscarry. And this is the main source of water in the city. And they can't go much longer without a miracle. You think the droughts in California are bad. Now the people can't flourish here unless something happens. They can't move on with life unless the water gets well. And Elisha, who has just seen his mentor leave him, happens to now be in Jericho resting a little bit. Elijah's no longer here. But now Elisha is inundated with people coming to him and saying, Elisha, isn't our city beautiful? Isn't our city prosperous? Isn't our city pleasurable? It's desirable. We've got the latest programs to help people. We've got the latest technology that they can use to win people. Elisha, isn't Jericho amazing? But with everything we have, our reach is limited because the water that's on the inside is not well. With all of the amenities that our city provides, nobody can live, nobody can grow, nobody can thrive. With all of the grandeur and the greatness that attracts the human eye when somebody passes by, Jericho is impacting nobody because on the inside, the abilities have become immobilized. And the effectiveness that was once sustained within our walls, Elisha, it's now non-existent. How did it get to this point? I don't know. But Jericho's got a problem. It's in a beautiful location. But Jericho can't reach beyond its borders. The atmosphere is charismatic. Everybody loves to jump and everybody loves to leap and everybody is happy. But on the inside, Jericho's become crippled. Because what's on the inside has become ineffective. And on this Sunday, I want to pose a question to every person in this house. If nobody can sip of the source when they walk into an atmosphere that is supposed to challenge them and change them, then why are we doing what we're doing? Come on, this is not about us. This is about him. This is not about you. This is about him. And my question to everybody here in this building today is, you may have the latest and greatest in the church, but how's the water? You may have the greatest social media presence in the world, but how's the water? You may have the greatest sound system, the greatest screen, everything up to date, but how's the source of life? Are people able to feel the Holy Ghost when they walk in? Are lives being changed when they walk in? Is the Spirit freely flowing when people, and don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not against the latest and the greatest, but you may have the latest facilities and the latest programs and the latest attractions and think you have arrived, but how's the water? water the church doors open and people are in awe at everything we do have as they walk inside but the question is is the spirit moving is the prayer room full is the fivefold ministry in operation are lives being transformed is the prophetic in action is healing happening are disciples being made is there a spiritual flow are there miracles and signs and wonder and yes I'm talking about us this needs to be happening in our churches more now than ever before. 
I wish somebody would believe me when I say that today. We ought to be seeing more miracles than anybody else. We ought to be seeing the dead raised. We ought to be seeing the blind. I'm not just preaching it to get you hyped. We ought to be seeing the dead raised and the blinded eyes open and diabetes. We ought to be seeing everything that we preach about. We ought to be seeing more miracles than anybody else. We ought to be having more breakthroughs than any. Thank you for believing me right there, sir. We ought to be having deeper moves of God than anybody else. Come on, somebody. We need to let the river flow. We need to let the water flow. We need to let the spirit flow because if the spirit is moving and if the spirit is flowing, there can be breakthrough. There can be done. I'm not about just looking great on social media, but inside somewhere, there's, there's we got to understand, there's people that are dying and going to hell. And a third day, and we get into the competition game. Instead of trying to magnify him, we're trying to outdo everybody else. And here's somebody, a guest, a visitor saying, come on, I just want to move with the Holy Ghost. I just want to move a God. I want services like we used to have. I want a drink of the living one. That's why I don't care how old the song is that we sing. If, if it gets the spirit moving and it gets the water flowing, I don't care what the lyrics are. Bring it on, baby. Give me the old song. I don't care what it gets. But I just want the water flowing. I just want the river flowing. I want the living water. can't forget it's not by might and it's not by power but it's by his spirit and comparison is the thief of revival because people are thirsty people just want a move of God people just want something different they tried the drugs they tried the alcohol they tried the world it didn't work and here they are thirsty saying I'm going to give God a chance that's why it's important you don't just come in and sit there, but you come in and start clapping your hands. You just come in and start lifting your voice because somebody's here and they're going to try the living water and they're going to find out that there's nobody like Jesus. There's nobody that can heal them like Jesus. There's nobody that can come on. I feel the water flowing in this house today. They're going to find out there's nobody that can transform their life like the man who transformed everything in the universe. They're going to find out, hey, I know the giver of life and if he can give me a new life he can give you a new life come on anybody feel the water flowing right now this is what people are hungry for that's why I clap that's why I run that's why I worship because somebody come on you know what happens when you begin to run you're stirring up the water you know what happens when you begin to worship you're letting the water flow you know what happens when you begin to lift your voice you're starting to let the water get through the come on we need the water flow how's the water in this I wish you'd lift up your hands right now Come on, I don't care what anybody else is doing. As for me and my church, we're going to pray. We're going to fast. We're going to be spiritual. We're going to do whatever we can to make sure the water is in the building. Come on, he said, I'm the living water. You drink of me, you're never going to thirst again. Come on, I know who he is. I know what he's capable of. I know my... As long as the water's flowing, everything's going to be all right. I don't care what programs you have or you don't have. As long as the water's flowing, everything's going to be all right. I don't care who's here, who's not here. As long as the water's flowing, everything's going to be all right. I don't care what signs of a building you do need. As long as the water's flowing, there's healing in the waters. There's miracle in the waters. There's deliverance in the water. So you better let the water flow. You better let the water... Man. And in all of our efforts to be effective and create change and let the water flow, it's so easy to get our focus off what really matters. It's so easy to get out of the routine of prayer and fasting, Pastor. It's so easy to become carnal in the day in which we're living. Never has there been a day when it's so easy to become carnal. 
And somehow the water gets polluted. And somehow the water gets murky. And somehow the water gets sick. And somehow the prayer stops. And somehow the fasting stops and we begin drinking from sources that produce barren ministries. And we, be, we begin to like preachers on social media who don't care about our souls. And harvest becomes limited and fruit becomes scarce and the miraculous can't move. And the prophetic is silenced because the water is not well. And after the members of Jericho realize our water's set, something has to happen. Something has to change. Yeah. Something's got to shift. Yeah. The people of Jericho come to Elisha and they say, we don't know how we got here, Elisha. We don't know how the Holy Ghost stopped moving. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know how we got out of the supernatural. Right. We don't know how all of the miracle signs and wonders stopped. But we need some help. Yeah. Elisha looks at him and says, okay, bring me a new jar. And when you bring it, go and fill it full of salt. I'm thinking, that doesn't make much sense. Fill a jar with salt. Surely the solution can't be that easy. Surely the answer can't be that simple. Surely the miracle can't manifest in that fashion. Surely the miraculous revival can't come like that. Doesn't make any sense. But then many of the miracles that God did in the Bible don't make sense. Dip in the water seven times, Naaman. Strike the, the rock, Moses, and water's going to come out. Put a cord in the window, Rahab, and you're the only go survivor. Send all of your men home, Gideon, in the middle of battle. Lay a lump of figs on the boil, Hezekiah. Let your shadow touch that man. What, what do you, uh, a lot of weird miracles in the Bible. But the prophet looks at him and says, just bring me a little bit of salt. And I begin to research all of the times that salt appeared in the Bible. And I found out we see it appears 35 times in 41 verses. Lot's wife became a pillar of salt. They would make covenants with salt. There was a city of salt. Unsavory things can't be eaten without Things would be preserved in salt. 18,000 men died in the battle of the valley. Of the priest would salt the sacrifice before offering it to the Lord. And that's just the Old Testament. But then I come to the New Testament and the first reference to salt I find is in Matthew 5 and 13 where Jesus said, hey everybody, let's take a trip up the mountain. I need to talk to you about a few things. And they finally get to the top and you knew this was coming. Jesus looks at him and says, I, I need to talk to you for a minute. And he begins to compare and contrast them with salt and the world. And and he tells them, I got a little bit of news for you. You are the salt of the earth. Another version says, you are the salt for the whole human race. Every tribe, every nation, every color, every race, every background, every name, every language, everybody. You are the salt for the entire human race. Jesus, since time began, knowing he would have a glorious church and knowing how evil the world would become and how things would only wax worse and worse, begins to explain that the only solution for a world that is sick and lost and dying is a little bit of salt. How do I know we're living in a sick world? Because today there will be 125,000 abortions. Today alone over 2,000 children will be kidnapped. Today alone over 1,130 people will be murdered. The water's sick. Today alone, over 1,600 will die from an overdose. Today in the United States, every 36 seconds, a child will hear the word divorce. And over 2,400 will separate. Hey, the water's sick. Today alone, 19% of high school students will consider committing suicide. Today alone, 3,700 teenagers in grade 9 through 9 through 12 will attempt to commit suicide. Today alone, 7 will succeed in committing suicide. The water is sick. And the Bible tells us that all of these things will come to pass and perilous times will come. But it also tells them that through all of this, there will be a church of which the gates of hell shall not prevail. 
And that ought to get somebody excited today. While hell is enlarging its borders and while people are longing for an answer and while everybody's wondering, is there any hope? I came to preach today the only solution for a sick world is the church of the living God. Come on, is anybody thankful you're part of the church today? If you are, I wish you'd clap your hands right now. The only solution for a sick world is the church. And Elisha tells him, hey, bring me a new jar and fill it with salt. And they bring it to him. Bring me those up here real quick if you could. Thank you so much for your help. Bring me a new jar and I want you to go fill it with salt. And they bring it to him and he takes the jar of salt and he goes to the spring. Gets the jar in his hand and he, he goes to where the spring is. And the Bible says he takes the salt in the new cruise and he begins to extend the salt and he begins to pour in. And as he begins to pour in, the Bible says that the waters were healed. Come on, somebody. The solution is the salt. The solution is the church. Healing came from a little bit of salt. Deliverance came from a little bit of salt. Revival came from a little bit of salt. Revival ain't going to happen. Revival's just going to have a little bit of... Come on, miracles came from a little bit of salt. But it went further than that. It said, you got the solution. You're the answer. But the miracle requires a little bit of motion. You got the solution, Santa Maria. But the power is in the poor. It's not going to happen just by you sitting there. But the miracles are going to take place when you begin to pour yourself in. You have the solution, but the power's in the pool. And he poured in. And he poured in. And he poured in. He poured in when he didn't feel like pouring in. He gave when he didn't feel like giving. He prayed when he didn't feel like praying. He sacrificed when he didn't feel like sacrificing. Hey, welcome to the church. If you don't like pouring in, you're in the wrong place. Because this is all about people. And people require somebody who's going to pour into them. Who's going to pour into them. Who's going to Who's going to pour in? Hey, when you don't feel like pouring, revival's going to come when you pour. And you pour. And you pour. When you don't feel like shouting, you ought to shout. Come on, when you don't feel like running, you ought to run. When you don't feel like clapping, you ought to clap. When you don't feel like raising your voice, you ought to raise your voice. Because this isn't going to just happen. It's going to happen when the church comes together and begins to pour in to this city, to this church, to this... And I came to preach to a church today. You're not afraid to pour. You're not afraid to give. You're not afraid to sacrifice. You're not afraid to give of yourself. But they have miracles in the house. It's just going to take somebody who's willing to teach a Bible study. Who's willing to witness to somebody. Who's willing to sacrifice a little financial. Come on, I know your missions weekend's coming up. But I feel like I came to help prepare the way of the Lord. For what's going to happen next weekend. You want to know how miracles are going to happen next weekend? It's going to be when you begin to pour. It's going to be when you begin to... (laughs) 
and he poured in. You want to know how revival's going to come? It's going to come when you just keep on pouring and you keep on giving and you keep on praying and you keep on fasting and you come on, somebody lift your hands right now. Come on, lift your hands in the building. This is going to require everything. Come on, you're giving. Your giving is pushing the enemy back. Your fasting is tearing down strongholds. Your words are building somebody up. Your blood, sweat, and tears is creating a foundation. But you got to be willing to pour yourself into this. You got to be willing to give this everything. At once was now what was now barren, now is fruitful. You want to know how you know, you know how salt comes out of the body the quickest way? It comes when you begin to sweat. And kingdom work takes somebody with grit that says, I'm going to sweat a little bit. I'm going to give a little bit. I'm going to push a little bit. Hey, you, have, you want the power? You're first going to learn, have to learn how to do the poor. It's not going to come by wishing revival's going to come. It's going to come by somebody getting in the harvest field and saying, I'm going to pour into this. I'm going to tell somebody about Jesus. I'm going to tell somebody there's still a healer that heals. There's still a deliverer that delivers. There's still a way. Come on, somebody that makes a way. You keep trying to become somebody else's savior and say, oh, I know you got hurt. Yeah. But, but just let, me, let, me, let me tell you a little bit about it. I'll justify your actions. You're called to be the saver, not a savior. Right. And we get the roles mixed up and we get puffed up in our pride because we think we need to add an I. Exactly. Let, me, let me tell you what I can do for you. Let me tell you what, no, 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 no. That got Satan kicked out of heaven. We got to get the eye out of the way and get back to him being the savior and us just being the saver. I don't rescue people when I have the biggest numbers. I don't rescue anybody off my social media account. You got to get rid of yourself. It's not going to be you. Come on, the water's sick. People are going to hell. Our world right now is bitter, it's wounded, it's offended, it's grieving, and it's deadly. And the solution for sick waters was and is and will always be the church. Come on, I'm so thankful I'm part of the church. The answer is the church. And there's never going to be a time when the world doesn't need the church. The church has survived through the onslaught. The church has made it through the fire. The church climbed over adversity. Pharaoh couldn't keep it in Egypt. Athaliah couldn't kill it. Herod couldn't eliminate it. In the middle of a pandemic, the church couldn't be stopped. In trying times, the church is the answer. And in uncertain times, the gates of hell shall not prevail. Again, stay in the church. Stay in the church. Stay in the church. Because the church is going to be what survives in the end time hour. You know what the world needs? It needs a little bit of salt. You know what your neighborhood needs? It needs a little bit of salt. You know what your job site needs? needs a little bit of salt. It needs somebody to tell them about the saving, glorious gospel that Jesus Christ died for. It needs somebody to tell them, hey, I know a resurrected Savior who can change your life. They need somebody to tell them, I know where miracles still happen. I, there's still a place that reaches out to the lost. The church is still a place that offers hope to the hopeless. The church is still a place that reminds everybody Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the... A world in trouble needs a church that has not lost faith that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ever ask or think. And the church cannot lose its savor. I was recently in a country and one of our missionaries began to tell me a story of something that had happened within this particular country. I asked if I could reshare this story. I asked his permission and he agreed 
But he just asked that his name and country be left out of the story because of the persecution that's currently happening there right now. But this missionary felt a particular burden and went to this, took his family and went to this, went to this country and they moved to this particular village. And this village was predominantly Buddhist and these villagers and these Buddhists did not like this missionary and they began to give him a hard time and tried to intimidate him and his family. They begin to, they begin to pester them. They begin to tell them, we don't want you here. We, want, we don't want you in our village we, to the point where it just, got, it just got crazy. And they told him, you need to leave. You need to pack up your stuff and go. We don't want a church here. We do not want this gospel of Jesus Christ here. We, we, we don't need it. We don't want it. We don't want anything to do with it. And <clears throat> to the point where these people went to the drinking source and the well at which these missionaries were living and they went over there and they began to pour poison in the missionary's drinking water in his well near the church and this missionary didn't know what to do he saw them pour the poison in but now he knew he couldn't drink it and he called another missionary and he said what do I need to do here I, I need some help I, I need some prayer we don't have any drinking water we can't survive without the water and the missionary told the other missionary that he had called he said let me pray about it for an hour and I'll get back with you right after an hour and he went to war in prayer and he called the missionary back in an hour that was in this, this, this Buddhist village and he called him and said I felt impressed by the story of Elisha in the Bible I want you to go and I want you to get the salt out of your cabinet and I want you to take it over to the well and I want you to begin like Elisha poured the salt in the water that was sick I want you to begin to pour the salt in the water that you're where, where, where you're near your well I want you to begin to pour it in your drinking water so the missionary went and got the salt out of his cabinet went over to the well where this where this man where, where, where this drinking water was where they had poisoned it and he got over to the well and he began to go take his salt and they began to start praying and as they were praying they began to say in Jesus name and he began to pour the salt that he had into the drinking water near the church where they were living and he began to pour the salt in and he poured everything in that he had and he gave it everything that they had there at the, there at the church and they didn't have much but they poured it all in and they poured everything they had into this well and they began to pray and they waited a couple of hours and after a couple of hours had passed the missionary went over and he took a glass and he drew some water out of the well and as he drew the water out of the well he poured it in a little glass and he put it in the glass and just said in Jesus name I'm being submitted I'm obedient and he took a sip of the water And after a few minutes had passed, nothing had happened to him. And he, he took another drink of the another drink of the water and nothing had happened. And a few minutes passed and he took another drink. And still nothing had happened. God had healed the waters where that missionary was. And now what was once dead and barren and, and sick now all of a sudden was healed and the missionary and his family had fresh drinking water they began they began drinking and living life like they had lived before but that wasn't the greatest miracle and that wasn't the best part of the story because after he had drank the water and everything had been healed the 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 the, 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 the other people and the villagers who had tried to drive this missionary out by poisoning their drinking water all of a sudden their, their well and their drinking water became deathly sick and they had no other choice but to come over where the missionary's well was and begin to ask the missionary if he had any water that he could spare and he said oh yeah I've got some water for you and now the only drinkable place in that entire village was at the well of the church Hey, let me give a word to you, Santa Maria Revival Tabernacle. What you've got in here is the real thing. Come on, what's inside of this building is the real thing. They can try everything else out there. But once they step into an atmosphere that's charged with the power of the Holy Ghost, they're never going to experience anything like it. And they're going to say, give me more of it. I want a little bit more water. Douse me in it. I just want a little bit more water. Give me some more water. Come on, somebody. We got to let the water flow. Even though they didn't want him. Even though they didn't like him. Now there's a church in the middle of nowhere in the middle of a predominantly Buddhist village because even though they hated it 
a little bit of salt changed everything and now a missionary's there teaching the gospel and now his family's there witnessing every day because a little bit of salt changed you know what's going to change our world? It ain't going to be anything on social media. It's going to be when you get out into the highways and the byways and say, come on, let me tell you about a Savior who can change your life. Let me tell you about who can heal you from cancer. Let me tell you about who can save your family. Let me pour into you. Come on, some of you need to teach a Bible study this week. Some of you need to witness to somebody in the grocery store this week. It's going to save our world. You can come to service after service and just sit there. Or you can choose to make up in your mind, I'm going to pour out. I'm going to pour out. I'm going to pour out. I'm Come on, don't you stop praying. Don't you stop fasting. Don't you stop giving. You keep on pouring. I need somebody with a made up mind to stand to your feet right now and say in 2024, I'm going to make a difference in my world. I'm going to pour out more than I've ever poured before. I'm going to give more than I've ever given before. I'm going to worship harder than I've ever worshiped before because there's power when I begin to pour. Come on, somebody, throw your hands towards heaven right now. God's trying to get a hold of somebody today to say, hey, there's a revival here. There's a breakthrough here. There's a miraculous encounter here. But it's going to take place when you get out of yourself and you learn 